So I want to thank uh, uh, Tammy and Sarah for inviting me to this really exciting thing, this idea of a deep confluence between human cognitive neuroscience and, uh, and clinical support for people, clinical trials and actually helping people is really exciting. Uh, uh, and so I'm going to talk today in the context of the science of change about an idea that my colleagues and I have been developing, that a particular use of cognitive neuroscience, human imaging, that we think is both pragmatic and you know, humanitarian, as this whole conference is about, uh, it is the use of brain imaging to predict individual outcomes in response to treatment. So uh, I, I think, you know, you could say that in one sense we're at a moment of great promise, but we're also at a great moment of uh, introspection and crisis, right, uh, in a sense, because uh, if we talk about neuropsychiatric diseases, including uh, addictions, um, there's been a ton of neuroimaging. Uh, so if you just put in the word MRI and a diagnostic label, like schizophrenia or alcoholism or addiction, you come up with thousands of publications. And that's not including EEG, uh, MEG, diffusion tensor imaging, or other modalities, okay? So for 17,000 MRI publications on major neuropsychiatric disorders, you know, for perhaps another equal number if you add up all the other modalities, who is treated differently today? Who is diagnosed differently today? What clinician acts differently today with all that information? And I'm a basic neuroscience person. I think we have to know the basic neuroscience to move forward. Uh, but I think the question is, what kind of neuroscience will help us in the foreseeable future? So, uh, you know, there's this picture uh, that is poking fun at the expansion of DSM uh, diagnostic criteria. Um, and if you would have said around 1990, if you would have said, uh, with everything we know about the human genome now, with all the advances in imaging of functional MRI, uh, both the technology and the kind of beautiful application you heard in the prior talks, that nothing in DSM would reflect anything about brain imaging or genetics, okay? Uh, you know, and no diagnosis, no treatment difference. You would have been seen as a sort of a sourpuss, right? You would have been seen as a pessimist. Like, how can not all that scientific knowledge improve our understanding of the complexity of neuropsychiatric disorders? But I think that's where we are. And I'm saying this maybe a little bit aggressively, but you, know, you can correct me a little bit. I think there's exceptions. Uh, the deep brain stimulation work of depression from Helen Mayberg takes advantage of identifying a uh, circuitry of depression. There's a couple of exceptions, but overwhelmingly, this is the case where we are right now. Uh, so I will talk about neuroimaging, and I'll, I'll talk today especially about MRI. Um, and, you know, just to give credit to the field that I've been in, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 we do know a ton more, a ton more about the function and structure of the human brain than we did 20 years ago. We know tremendously, which we didn't know before, about variation in that. Variation by the age you are, uh, personality, sex, culture, socioeconomic status. We had no glimpse of those kinds of things and how the variability of human uh, nature plays out in terms of brain structure and function. Um, we do know, because it's visible and objective and measurable, there are brain differences for psychiatric uh, uh, categories. Uh, this is not a room where you have to make that argument, but many of you know historically, people said, no, it's just bad character, it's just a, you know, people not trying or pulling up their socks and being undepressed. Uh, so, so, you know, I mean, so it is important to know that biology and know it differentially for different diagnosis, but again, whose life is better? Um, so one of the things we know, and we, uh, you know, don't tend to talk about it a lot because we mostly tend to say an intervention works or it doesn't work if it's P less than 0.05 and reviewers will let us say that. Uh, but we know, everybody knows, that almost every effective intervention is only effective for a meaningful subset of, of, of patients, right? So that uh, across many different studies, you'll come up with numbers like 30 to 60 percent of individuals are meaningfully helped. Where you draw that boundary is a little subjective. Uh, and so to pick one example, uh, six, the literature said about 60% of patients seeking treatment for alcohol use relapsed within six months. So this, you know, the treatment did not work for them in the way you wish it did. And that's true, though, not just for uh, treatment of alcoholism. That's true for practically every uh, neuropsychiatric disorder. They all hover in this, you know, 30 to 60% range. Um, so, of course, we want to discover new uh, molecules and new treatments. That's the dream, and that will come, hopefully, from basic neuroscience laboratories. But in the years and perhaps decades before that, how will lives get better? So one question is, can we do a better job of matching people to interventions that will really help them, what people have called personalized medicine. It's been renamed, rebranded recently as precision medicine. It's the same idea. 
Uh, and I think, you know, the basic idea is the more we study the brain and the more we study genetics and psychology in combination, the more stunningly individual people are, okay? Far beyond what we could have imagined. Um, and so uh, uh, patients will sometimes describe, and I know it's not like this exactly from the viewpoint of a clinician, you know, that, and their family, so they feel like there's a bit of a roulette wheel they go into. Oh, we'll try this. You know, we hope it works, good reason. You know, if it doesn't work, we'll try that. And if it doesn't work, we'll try that. And of course, uh, everybody will want to help uh, as, until something successful is found. But we know that the loss of uh, months and years is very tough on patients. Um, and sometimes patients just disappear from treatment altogether. So uh, I'm going to just show you a tiny bit of evidence from, from our work. Uh, and, and there's a lot of terrific work out there. Some of it was referred to uh, from Judson Brewer and his colleagues at Yale earlier, uh, asking whether brain imaging can right now you know, uh, and, and uh, do get close to predicting outcomes in a way that other clinical measures do not. Of course, you don't need brain imaging to predict outcomes if you could just say, well, we have a certain information about the severity of your disorder, or we know your age, or something else, right? Uh, and can we have neuroindividuality? Can we match up by brain imaging something very individual about a brain with the likelihood that a specific treatment will work for a person? So. Uh, you, you already heard the quote this morning, and we, we, none of us. I, I was glad to hear, you know, that Vince doesn't know where it came from either. Uh, <laughs> uh, these are these dangerous internet uh, uh, things. Uh, and, and I'm going to tell you something else. All the research that we do in this field is a bit of a cheat at the moment, because uh, there's this quote from Kierkegaard, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. So in the research I'll show you today, and all the research about it, um, we know the outcomes of the treatment. We're not really predicting the future. You know, we know who won the World Series or how the stock market's going to go, right? So we'll win that bet. But we want to ask if, if we look at brain imaging before people underwent treatment, could we predict far better than we can currently by other measures uh, who will benefit from the treatment and who will not? So uh, in this study uh, uh, that I'll focus on, where we had our largest sample and could look at this most closely, social anxiety disorder, excessive and unreasonable fear of social situations, uh, very common disorder, and in a severe disorder, quite dis uh, debilitating. So for example, to pick one outcome measure, uh, individuals who have social anxiety disorders have twice the rate of unemployment compared to uh, generalized anxiety or depression. And nobody knows why exactly, but one can imagine that just going to an interview to get a job is already a tremendous hurdle for somebody with severe social anxiety. And so in the study, we looked, uh, uh, in general, uh, treatments are either cognitive behavioral therapy or pharmacology. And again, in both cases, about half of patients are meaningfully helped. Uh, you know, when I told this information to my neuroscience colleagues, they didn't believe it, but you know it. Uh, no evidence for the clinician as to which treatment to give to a patient. It's based on uh, uh, cultural things locally, health plans, you know, uh, uh, you know, reasonable interpretations of the situation of a patient. But, really, but no, uh, no scientific basis or evidence for picking one treatment over another. So in this study with 51 patients, we looked at brain imaging before and after they underwent uh, CBT, and we asked uh, in two studies I'll show you, one using a, a task and looking at activation, one using multimodal connectomics. Can we do better in predicting outcomes on a person-by-person -person basis uh, than disease severity, which is another commonly used uh, measure? Uh, and in, in this case, the Leibowitz social anxiety scale was used in this NIH study of the clinical trial um, as, as the, the outcome measure. And you get a pretty good correlation. You get a 0.3 correlation, so that accounts for, you know, about 10, 12 percent of the variance uh, in terms of how much you benefited. The more severely disordered people were, uh, the more they benefited from the CBT on average. So uh, in the fMRI activation task, uh, individuals went in before and after imaging, but I'll just talk about before. And they saw either positive, either uh, negative and neutral scenes. We compared those two things, or neutral and negative faces. So these are the social stimuli. It turns out these kinds of scenes had no predictive value, but the social stimuli did for social anxiety disorder. And here briefly is what we found, that in posterior areas of, of, the, of the brain and visual cortices, we got quite strong correlation. So what this correlation is showing you is how much people improve from the CBT. Each dot is an individual. And this is showing you the magnitude of activation in that location. And you can see in these two visual areas posteriorly, the more people were activated for the negative compared to neutral faces, the more likely they were uh, to benefit from the treatment. Um, and the correlation is much better than 0.38. Um, uh, you know, one funny thing about these kinds of analyses, if we had just looked at the difference between those two, we would have gotten zero activation in this part of the brain. Because if you look at this line, about half the people went one direction, about half the people went the other direction, right? You average them, we would have had zero activation. So one of the major, I'll come back to this in a moment, what we're really 
focusing on variation among patients, not general properties of the patients. And if we just do a median split, uh, we can see that on average the activation uh, 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 for the people who benefited uh, substantially from, uh, from the CBT and the people who, who not so much. And if we ask how close are we to practical, well, I don't want to say imaging is ready to do this at tomorrow, but think about this. Uh, LSAS predicted 12% of the variance, the fMRI 40%. Okay? So uh, all of a sudden, if you have a tool that would give you 40% uh, of the variance, if you could tell with much greater likelihood whether a patient would or would not benefit from CBT, that you get much closer to having, I think, a practical tool for making a judgment. And we could have a discussion at the end, like, does everybody have to go through fMRI or something? You know, uh, I have no conflict of interest with Siemens or GE or anything, so I, you know, it's a, I, I, I'm neutral on that point, and I, I'm glad to talk about that a little bit. I won't dwell on that now, but I'm glad to come back to that. Um, the other measures we did on these are uh, of the flavor of, from Vince Calhoun's talks, connectomics, looking um, at a diffusion tensor imaging and resting state functional connectivity. Uh, I, I think all of you know this stuff, so I have some three quick slides on each just in case your, your clinician is not as, 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 as spends your time on it. But I'll tell you the appeal of connectomics beyond the philosophy that brains are networks, not, not islands, but the appeal from a practical sense is it's easy to do them about the same way from site to site. You know, it hurts my pride because, uh, we, you know, for those of us who do uh, cognitive neuroscience with imaging with humans, one of the things we pride ourselves on is the cleverness or thoughtfulness of the designs, right? You know, like how are, how are we getting you to regulate your brain in a certain way by the design of the experiment? On the other hand, that's a little tougher to replicate from site to site across uh, hospitals. And, and so these things are, everybody could do it pretty much the same way if they wanted to. It takes only, it could take five minutes per measure. You could spend more time, but ours are on that scale. And you don't have to ask the person to do anything. They do have to stay still enough to, for the measure to be good. That's a meaningful thing. But they don't have to follow instructions, push buttons, or anything like that. Um, so you know this, the diffusion tensor imaging visualizes white matter uh, based on the movement of uh, molecules of water. Uh, uh, if you're a myelin, myelinated axon, you're a pretty big cellular uh, structure compared to a molecule of water. If, if water is flowing in the cerebral spinal fluid, for example, it can go anywhere. But if it's around a strong myelinated uh, tract, it has to flow somewhat parallel with the tract. And then we can produce pictures like this. Let's see what it is. Is, is this just for fun? <laughs> it's real. It's a real person's brain. Uh, uh, but it's just visualizing where uh, the water is flowing and the inferred uh, white matter organization connecting front to back of the brain or, to, or up and down or left and right. And uh, resting state functional connectivity, uh, we, we know that uh, certain parts of the brain, the bold signal will highly correlate with one another, like this is left and right motor cortex from the original Biswall paper. Um, other parts of the brain don't correlate, and we assume that parts that travel together in activation, laying there doing nothing spontaneously, uh, uh, having the same bold dynamics, that we think they're part of a network you know, that frequently communicates with one another. Um, and you've seen the slides again from before this morning that these kinds of networks have been well identified and aligned with a lot of what we know about the brain. So uh, the only data slide I'll show you is our summary slide on this paper, that, on these data that are in review. So now we, we combine the diffusion tensor imaging and the resting state functional MRI. So two measures of connectomics measured a couple different ways. Uh, if we just have the initial severity, what's available to clinicians, clinicians now if they wanted it, that would account for about 10% of the variance in how well people responded to the CBT, how much they improved. If we add in all of our connectomic measures, we go to about 60%. Okay? So that's a five-fold increase. Now, if you're talking about 60% of the variance in response to treatment, that's a pretty substantial piece of information. This is one study, so we'd, you know, we'd have to keep going, but uh, that could be, a, in my opinion, the possibility of a game changer in directing patients now to treatments that exist now, but not sending them to ones that are unlikely to work for them. Um, this is just a graph showing you the individual patient by patient data. Um, and uh, uh, there's been nice work referred to this morning. Uh, you know, an early leader has been in the group at Yale on this and Judson Brewer uh, using other measures like fMRI uh, to predict uh, relapse in alcoholism. So it's you know, very salient, you know, already the evidence is. There haven't been large scale studies uh, on prediction yet that I'm aware of uh, uh, for patients already with, who are alcohol dependent, uh, but certainly there's very promising data on smaller data sets. 
So let me say a word then about uh, some of the issues. So one thing is, this kind of imaging is all about heterogeneity of patients. Uh, it's right, it's th what's different among the patients that makes them susceptible to benefiting from one treatment versus not. Um, second, what we're really imaging is not the pathophysiology of the disorder, which has always been the goal of the research and still remains an important goal. We're measuring the mechanisms of change or healing, okay? <laughs> we're asking not if a certain part of the brain is atypical in a patient, which we usually ask, you know, larger or smaller in, or volume, more or less connected, more or less active. That's what we usually do compared to, you know, pre-post or compared to controls, we're asking what's different in the brain of somebody who responds to a particular form of treatment. Uh, and that's what I think clinicians, families, and patients need to know. Um, and in a certain way, you know, the science will follow this because we have to say, like, wow, it's pretty interesting. If somebody has a certain mechanism of change or healing in their brain that's available for treatment and somebody does not, that's a, that opens up a science question of, you know, what is that mechanism of healing that allows CBT to be helpful for one person and not another? Um, I'll just say very briefly that uh, uh, we're outlined in detail in a paper in, in Neuron that we need to, uh, and many people know this, if we do simple correlations, those kinds of analyses are not robust for predicting the next person's response. We get correlations. We want to have a so-called out-of-sample things. If a patient comes in as a candidate for treatment, we need to predict on the basis of prior knowledge for this new person, right? We can't wait for their outcome. We need to do prior knowledge. And so there are statistical models, uh, sort of a leave one out models and so on like that, uh, that do are much more generalizable and predictable. And we need to use those, I think, as we move towards any thought about practical application of this knowledge. Because in the end, we have to have a statistically valid prediction for an individual. So it's a, there's a fascinating, I think, uh, 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 attention in, in terms of thinking about big data sets, discovering huge things that we could not, not have known. But the clinician sits across the table with a single patient. Okay, uh, and if we don't think about how that plays out, uh, you know, you know, we may end up with huge generalizations that are hard to uh, implement uh, in, in, real, in real clinical settings. Um, another huge thing for us going into the future is, you know, where we have alternative treatments, we want the brain measures to tell us not only are you not likely, for example, to benefit from CBT, but are you much more likely to benefit from a particular pharmacological one? Because very often the issue is not. I think, I'm not a clinician, right? But I think the issue is not like, oh, you're not likely to benefit from CBT, go home and good luck, right? <laughs> the question is, amongst the menu of available treatments, which is the one that's most likely to be helpful, or a combination of them? Um, and, you know, it'll be a fascinating thing to compare, uh, for example, uh, something like, you know, say, one version of CBT versus mindfulness. Is it a shared mechanism? Is it different? Uh, you know, we, don't, we haven't even gotten to that, to that stage of analysis yet. Um, and uh, the, you know, lastly, you know, we could worry about costs. Uh, I, I think it's a false issue. I, I think the cost, uh, uh, it's not a false issue, cost matters, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, the cost of an MRI, if, you, if, if you're not, uh, is, is far less than the cost of uh, a treatment failure just in dollars, just in visits to a physician and so on, right? Uh, just in, in workups uh, that follow. So I, I think the costs are not the biggest problem uh, if, in, in a sheer economic analysis humanitarian uh, goals to the side. Uh, you know, some people worry about the ethics of something like this, you know, it, 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 you know hopefully clinicians would use this wisely, would insurance companies use it, you know, as benignly. Uh, 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 but in the end, we're saying the goal is to move people to treatments that work for them above the 50% rate uh, that currently is, is pretty common. And I think that's just a, a big enough goal uh, given our absence of knowledge. And for, scientifically, it's actually kind of an appealing problem because the bar is so low. Understanding how the brain really does stuff is really hard. <laughs> uh, getting beyond chance to the way people move to various treatments now, we ought to be able to do that you know, collaboratively as a community, right? That's a, that's a doable task, I think. It's not, it's not discovering deep things about uh, brains. Um, so I have terrific collaborators and, and sources of support, and, and this work is summarized in this neuron paper, and, and I'm very grateful to be part of this conference, which has such a wonderful spirit of, of intertwining uh, a science and clinical uh, help to people. Thank you very much.